love. Uh, I am excited on this Palm Sunday. We call it that because this is the day that Jesus triumphantly rode into Jerusalem. And people, unfortunately, did not realize exactly what was going to happen in just a few days' time at that moment. And uh, we, while we... It's a bittersweet time to think about what Jesus suffered for us. It's bitter because we think about he suffered because of me. He had done nothing wrong at all. All that he took was my sin. He had none of his own. But then it's sweet because we think about and we remember that that's the value that God placed on us. Jesus Christ said, you're worth so much to me that I'm willing to give my entire life for you. I'm willing to die. I'm willing to suffer for you. But fortunately, he did not stay dead. Three days later, they went to that tomb and they found it to be empty. And that's what we get to celebrate next Sunday on Resurrection Sunday. And we are going to be out on the field. Now, our church has ordered some new chairs since we've been having some issues with some of our folding chairs and such. But unfortunately, as many of you know, the shipping issues, although they were ordered many weeks ago and were supposed to be here this last week, there has been a delay. And so I would encourage you to possibly, if you have a camping chair or something, bring your own chair. Next week we will have some chairs set up, but just in case, as last several years, we have you know, had many, many, many people join us for Easter Sunday. And God is doing some awesome things in our church and in our community. And I'm excited for what God's going to do this coming Easter Sunday in the hearts of many people. And this coming week on Wednesday, as we think about what Jesus did for us on the cross, we have what we call a tenebrae service. And it's kind of an old traditional service from centuries ago that it's mainly it's focusing on worship in the shadows. And what we mean by that is we'll start at 7 o'clock this coming Wednesday night, and so it'll still be a little light outside as we begin the service, and we'll have a few candles lit, and we'll basically be reading the story of Jesus' life and singing a few songs leading up and remembering to that point where his body was sealed away in the tomb, and the candles one by one get snuffed out, and so as the sun sets, it gets darker, the candles get snuffed out, it gets darker until... Just like as Jesus' body was sealed away, and as we sung in that song, darkness thought it had won. Darkness rejoiced as though heaven had lost. But then we leave in silence to come back a few days later on Easter Sunday, celebrating, worshipful, rejoicing in the fact that the stone was rolled away. And as they looked in, the angel said, he is not here. He is risen just as he said. Why are you looking for the dead? I'm sorry, the living among the dead. He's not here. And what an awesome thing that we get to serve, a risen Savior. So I encourage you, if you've never been a part of one of these, or if you have been, join us this coming Wednesday night at 7 o'clock as we remember what Jesus did. And we will be receiving communion that night as well, just like Jesus did with his disciples at that the night before he went to the cross, we will remember what Jesus did in receiving the bread and the cup. And so I encourage you to be with us that night for a wonderful time of sobering worship. A wonderful time to remember what Christ did for us. And then also this week, uh, we have our Escape the Tomb uh, Easter escape room outreach happening. And I just want to share with you couple of things that God's doing. This is why I say, God, I believe that we are, we are experiencing something in our church right now. And when God begins to move, Satan and the demons, they don't just roll over and say, oh, I guess we lost. We'll just have to take it from here on. No, they're going to start fighting even harder. When the forces of darkness don't have to mess with us, that's when we know we're not doing anything in God's will. But when the dominion of darkness starts to really rear its ugly head and fight against us, that shows me that something's happening, and we've got them nervous. We've got them on the run. 
And this last week, I was thinking about that uh, a couple of years ago, we actually had some people that uh, left the church because they said, I, I don't know why you guys do these game things and things like that. You know, we just need to preach the gospel. Okay, we're just trying to help people that maybe have never heard about Jesus before. We had a group here this Friday night. And you think, okay, I'm signing up for an escape the tomb Easter thing. I'm probably at least familiar with the Easter story. That family had never heard about Jesus. They kind of thought they were signing up for some like Easter egg kind of a hunt thing and weren't exactly sure what was going on. And um, the people that were here, we kind of, you know, walked them through and we were talking about, you know, what Easter's here, what Easter's about. And I was uh, inviting them to come back for some of our other things, our vacation Bible school and some some of the other ministries that we got going on throughout the spring and summer. But it just hit me. The fact that there are people, and as a guy that I've been in church since, you know, before I ever took my first breath on this earth, it's weird to me to think that there might be people in the United States of America, okay, find some Muslim country or some other place where they've never heard of Christ, I can accept that, but there are people right here. People in their 50s that had some kids that were 12, 10, and 6 that had no idea what Easter was really about. And it just confirmed to me, once again, why we do things like this. Well, shouldn't we, quote unquote, just preach the gospel in church? Yeah, we should continue doing that. And if you've been here more than one Sunday, you know, I'm not going to quit doing that. But why do we do special, specific outreaches like this? Because I guarantee you that family would have never come to a church service. Yet they came and they at least got a seed planted about what Easter is really all about. I'm praying that they're going to be here on Easter Sunday. I'm praying that they might come back for Vacation Bible School to hear about how God created them and designed them for an awesome purpose. How Jesus Christ loves them and died for them. I tell you, it just, it reinforced to me once again this week why we need to keep moving forward for Christ. And why we need to keep trying things and keep doing things and, and not just get satisfied with, oh, this is what, how it's always been and this is what we've always done and this is it. We just got to keep going. Because there are now, in that family, a couple of generations that had never heard of Jesus. And our country is only having more and more and more of those kind of people as more and more people get away from church and get away from Christ and have only heard negative things. We've got to keep reaching out. That's the mission that Jesus left us here for. To go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. So I hope you'll be praying with me that God would continue to use that outreach this week. We have several more groups signed up to come through. and uh, Maybe you've got some extra time and you might want to there's a little sign-up sheet there in the back of the church. You might say, oh, I'm not sure. I'll, I'll sign up to come help. I'll teach you what you need to do. We'll show you exactly how you can be a part of it and how you can also be praying that lives will be changed. So at this time, as we come to the Scriptures, we like to read this passage from Psalms 86 each week as a way of focusing our hearts and our minds on God's Word. So let's read this together, ready, and begin. Teach me your way, Lord, that I may rely on your faithfulness. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, Lord my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. 
for great is your love toward me. And at this time, the kids can be dismissed to go to the junior church where they're going to get an age-appropriate lesson. And one more thing I forgot to kind of mention is that next Sunday on Easter Sunday, I'm excited about people that have decided that they want to step forward, identify publicly with Jesus Christ and believers' baptism. And we have several people that are going to be getting baptized this next Sunday already. And I can't think of a better time to do it than really just the soonest you can. But uh, if you're going to have it soon, then make it on Easter when we remember the fact that you're standing there signifying this is how I was before I knew Christ. I was dead in my sins. And just like Jesus was all the way buried, we go all the way under the water and then all the way back up, now saying I'm going to walk in newness of life. And I'm excited uh, for this for a few reasons. Number one, I just, I love seeing people identify with Christ. I love, I love people saying, I'm going to stake it down. I want it to be publicly known. I'm one of his children. And I want you to help hold me accountable also. And that's the thing for us, church family. When people get baptized, that's a way of also saying, all right, I'm going to come alongside of you. I want to help you grow. I'm going to be praying for you. We're going to be pulling together now in life. The other reason I'm excited about this, though, is that there's no real prescription in the New Testament for who can baptize other than the sense that uh, Jesus gave the great commission to the church. Go into all the world, teaching them, observe, uh, teaching them and baptizing them in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and then teach them to observe all things, whatever I've commanded you. And so really, if that was just for the disciples, then that means the gospel kind of died with the disciples. But no, that great commission was given to the church, was given to God's people. And I think it's a wonderful symbol of authority that there is not only church authority in that pastors and elders can baptize, but there are others within the church. If you are living a right Christian life, I see no reason why you cannot underneath the authority of a local New Testament church, I'm not saying just go out and baptize whoever you want, whenever you want, but underneath the authority of a local New Testament church, I think it speaks to the additional authority within a household when a father, if you say we have a man that's saved and his family gets saved, what an awesome privilege to have that father be able to be a part of baptizing his family. What an awesome thing for a husband to be able to baptize his wife or vice versa. Say you have a wife that's prayed for her husband for decades and then he gets saved. Oh, what about... Isn't, it's underneath the authority of the church. I'm saying this to you now because I know that there may be some people that have never seen anyone else besides a pastor perform the ordinance of baptism. And if you have concerns about that, I'd love to talk with you about that more this next week because you'll see it next week. There will be people in addition to me that will be baptizing others in our church because I think it's the right way to go. I think that's how we get multiplication in God's house and in God's family. We see it expand beyond just one or two people. And now, in the name of Jesus Christ, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, I'm excited to have people get baptized and stand up and say, I am placing myself underneath the authority God has put into my home. I am placing myself under the authority God has put in this church. And ultimately, I'm putting myself under the authority of Jesus Christ because he is now the Lord of my life. That's what baptism is all about. And so, that was all just a big aside, and I've now used up about 10 minutes of my preaching time. So Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4 is where we're going to be today in this last kind of, of a few-week series of Jesus versus. So Jesus was against the devil himself, and then Jesus was against some kind of... Uh, religious tradition and things that they had thought they had right but they had messed up and we left it last week where the people kind of ran Jesus out of town and they were going to try to push him off a cliff and kill him because he had said some things they didn't like and didn't agree with but Jesus sort of poof was gone he just kind of walked through their midst and they didn't see him and following that now in verse uh, 31 is where we pick it up. Luke chapter 4 and verse 31. So then he, that's Jesus, went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on the Sabbaths. 
it's, in, it's important to see that there because it's not just the Sabbath, meaning one week, but Sabbaths. So Jesus was here for an extended period of time, at least a few weeks, continuing it, his regular kind of regimen of being in a place where people would come together to listen to teaching, and he was astonishing them. And that's the thing it says in verse 32, they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. Wow. Again, I just think, what would it have been like to have heard Jesus teach? I read through the, the few sermons of his and his teaching that we have in the scriptures, and it just it seems so simple to understand in some ways, and then so deep to understand once you get past the surface. And that is the, the amazing thing about a wonderful teacher that's able to take deep concepts and make them understandable, yet then also be able to give you a lot to chew on. We're moving past just the mountaintops. We're moving past just the, the easy kind of uh, idiomatic sort of, here, I'm going to give you one little phrase that you'll keep with you. No, we've got to get deeper than some of that surface level stuff. But his teaching, man, it was with authority. It was not just, well, I'm going to read this and say that. No, people sensed his power. Then in verse 33, now in the synagogue, there was a man who had a spirit of an unclean demon. He cried out with a loud voice saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Do you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Interesting how the demons have no problem identifying who Christ is. Yet, the chosen people, a couple of verses before this, they wanted to shove Jesus off a cliff and kill him. They didn't recognize their Messiah, and yet here is now this demon-possessed man in the synagogue. Oh, shouldn't that be a place where demons aren't allowed? You see, God sometimes brings people that need healing into a religious place. When those sinners start coming to church, and we got to keep the church clean, and we got to keep the church pure, right? Those sinners, they belong outside. The church is for the saved. Wrong. The church is a place where God brings people who need to have a community, a fellowship, a, a understanding of who he is. Now, again, <clears throat> you can come as you are. I don't expect you to leave as you were, though. If you simply come to church and there's never any conviction, there's never any change, then you haven't met with Christ. You can read your Bible every single day of your life. You can pray, I'm going to use my quote, pray every single day of your life. But if there's no change in your heart and soul, you haven't met with Christ. But this demon-possessed man, he calls out Jesus for who he is. He knows exactly who he is. But we'll see a change because this man genuinely met with Christ. But Jesus rebuked him saying, Be quiet and come out of him. When the demon had thrown him in their midst, it came out of him and did not hurt him. See, and this is an interesting thing. A lot of times we'll see various demonic presences throughout Jesus' life that when they were trying to control someone, they loved to hurt people. It saddens me when I hear about people that want to mutilate their bodies or want to cause themselves harm or they want to deal punishment because I'm just they, they, they are emotionally hurting they're mentally hurting and so they feel like they feel ugly in their minds and in their hearts and so I need to damage this body that's from Satan that's from the demons that's from hell when we want to cause ourselves hurt because well I deserve this for the things that I've done Jesus took that punishment Sure, feel guilty over the things that you've done wrong, but then accept his forgiveness and let's move forward in Christ now. Jesus rebuked this demon and said, come out of him. And the man was no longer hurt. Is there something in your life that's trying to control you? 
Now here's the positive thing. As a Christian, you can never, ever, ever, ever be demon-possessed. When the Holy Spirit, at the moment of your salvation, came and indwelled you, oh, I just feel like there's some inside of me in this... Uh, our, our minds are amazing things that God has given to us, but they're also really amazing liars. Our minds can get us to believe a lot of things. I do genuinely believe in real demonic spiritual beings. But Jesus Christ has power. Versus, when it's Jesus versus the demons, they have nothing against him. He says one thing to them, and boom, they're gone. They can't fight him. This is not some big war. This is not ten rounds. This is one punch from Christ, TKO on the mat. But I do think sometimes, though, in our lives, and even as Christians, we can get some stuff in our minds, and while it may not be a demonic presence, we can get demonic thoughts. What I mean by that is thoughts of darkness, thoughts that are just, they're, they're not from God. Our flesh gets us to believe all kinds of lies about the scriptures and about who Jesus is and how much God cares for us and how valuable we are to him. Our minds can, can confuse us about identity and who I am and if I would just, if people would just accept this thing about me, then I could truly be who I am. Don't believe those lies. Understand your value in Christ. Let him rebuke those lies. Now there's, it's not normal in many Baptist circles. A lot of times in other places people love to say, I rebuke this and I rebuke that. I'm not saying it's not scriptural, but instead of saying I rebuke this in the name of Jesus, how about we continue to pray, hey Jesus, I'm really not really like in this situation that I'm in right now? If it would be your will, please take this away and rebuke it in your power. But if it's not your will, Lord, if it's your will for me to go through this, that way I will draw closer to you or others will draw closer to you. Let your grace be upon me to endure. Rather than I rebuke this in the name of Jesus, Lord, give me the grace to endure. A lot of our modern vernacular, the word, we like to use the word patience. I like the old King James long-suffering. Because sometimes we do have to suffer for a long time to understand and see what God is doing. I don't think this guy enjoyed being demon-possessed. But what a testimony now as he got a chance to truly meet with Christ and have his life changed. So the demon came out of him and didn't hurt him. In verse 36, then they were all amazed and spoke them among themselves, what a word is this? For with authority and power he commands unclean spirits and they come out. And the report about him went into every place in the surrounding region. So this is now going to become a common thing where People hear about Jesus, and they want him to do all kinds of things. And why does Jesus sometimes tell them, hey, don't spread the word yet, or don't talk about this? Because while he has the power to heal, and while he used that power to heal, that was not his main purpose in coming. His main purpose was not just to cast out demons. His main purpose was to eventually go to the cross for you and for me. They saw a very small portion of, of the power of Christ. But they didn't see the big picture that he did. But the word starts to spread, and so then, now he arose, in verse 38, from the synagogue and entered Simon's house. This is Peter. But Simon's wife's mother, so mother-in-law, was sick with a high fever, and they made request of him concerning her. Wow, so we've already seen him do some amazing things. So we... We, we've heard about him doing miracles. He casts out demons. Now we've got somebody sick. All right, so he stood over her and rebuked the fever, and it left her. So not only does Jesus have power over the demonic forces, he has power over disease. 
Now, Luke, we know who wrote the gospel, was a uh, physician. He was a doctor. All of the words used in this place here, some people say, well, this was probably another demon. That, now, Luke used very specific words, all medical terms in the Greek language, for exactly what was wrong with her. He knew that this was, when he was hearing the testimony of this, when whoever it was, Peter or the other disciples talking about this, and he was writing this out, he was saying, wow, I know, I can almost imagine Luke saying, I bet I know exactly what's wrong with her. I'm diagnosing her right now it, from their testimony. She had a disease. And then Jesus stands over, and once again, he rebukes it. He uses his power and said, be gone. The difference now between this kind of a healing and a lot of the healings, and I'm going to use my quote, healings that we see in some modern churches today, how many people were around and where did this happen? It happened in someone's house. I always get amazed at many of the quote-unquote faith healing preachers of today that only seem to have the gift of healing in a public setting with a band around them playing all kinds of energizing music down at Arco Arena or whatever it's called now. but yet never seem to have that power to go to a hospital and heal people there. I believe God still miraculously heals people today. I hate that I have to always make this caveat whenever I talk against the faith healing movement, but God does miraculously heal people today. I have no doubt in my mind. But... I don't think he needs to have a human vessel to do it. And the times that I have seen, the majority of the times that I have heard testimony of people having genuine healing like this, where she immediately recovered and then stood up and began serving them. I don't know about you, but when I'm sick with the flu, when I've had a fever for a few days, I don't just like take some Tylenol and then suddenly I'm like, bam, back at 100%. Woo, let's go. Who, what, what can I do today? How can I serve? I mean, man, I was five minutes ago throwing up. Now I'm ready to go. That doesn't happen. No, I take like the next day, you're like, oh, I'm feeling like kind of 50% better. Then the day after that, yeah, I'm probably about 80% now. And then maybe after another few days, week, whatever, then you're at 100% immediately she stood up and starts ministering to all of the people that were there. That's the kind of healing that Jesus does. And the majority of the healings that I have heard testimony of have been in a place just like this where it was somebody praying in their own home, a church body praying for someone, saying, God, please heal. And then they go and they get the cancer diagnosis and the doctor says, the, the cancer's gone. <laughs> what happened? Wow, that, that, that bone healed a lot faster than I've ever seen. Wow, you in that kind of an accident, you, you should be dead right now. The way the car crushed around you, you shouldn't be alive. And just So again, I believe God does miraculous things. But I take issue with people abusing and perverting the name of Jesus by saying that in Jesus name I'm rebuking this disease when really it's all about hey can I sell some more uh, tickets to my latest book or whatever it is. It disgusts me. But this kind of a thing that Jesus does where he genuinely heals people and they are immediately completely not just, hey, I touched your shoulder because it was kind of, you know, my, my collarbone hurt. And then I touched it. And yeah, now, now I can lift up my arm. Yeah, I'm healed. Ah, oh, praise God. No. Immediately and completely. That's how we know that miraculous healing has taken place. So she stands up and begins to serve them. And then in verse 40, when the sun was setting... All those 
those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. I can't blame people. If I had a child or if my wife was sick, if someone that I loved was, was hurting with something, and I heard about somebody that could miraculously heal them, I would do whatever I could. Whatever I could. I'd pay any amount of money. I'd rent whatever carriage. We'd travel whatever distance. And that's what started to happen. Word began to spread about this guy, Jesus. And people were coming from all over the place, and he laid hands on every one of them and healed them. And demons also came out of many, crying out and saying, You are the Christ, the Son of God. But he, rebuking them, did not allow them to speak, for they knew that he was the Christ. Now, why would Jesus do that? Why would Jesus not want them to speak out the truth of who he was? Because, again, his whole mission was not just to come and cast out demons and heal diseases in that moment for that, that temporary moment because all of us are still going to die. Even if I had cancer and got miraculously healed, time is undefeated. Eventually, I'm going to die. It's just a part of this sin-cursed world. So Jesus knew that if his whole ministry got bogged down with only doing these kind of miraculous healings, that there was a lot of teaching and a lot of investing and a lot of setting up his disciples to then go and turn the world upside down with the gospel. That was going to be hindered. And so he rebuked them and he said, no, don't talk about who I am right now because it's not time for that yet. It's amazing to me, though, still, that his disciples, after seeing these kinds of things and hearing this, and then him even talking about how he was going to die and be resurrected, that they missed it. And then it just constantly makes me think, though, it's easy to look at the disciples and think, how could they miss it? But what have I missed in my life? What has God been knocking on my head about and said, how is it not obvious to you what you need to change? I've only made you long suffer like eight times about this same issue. Yet you still have missed it. And so it's easy for us to judge the disciples, but if you've walked with Christ now for a period of time and he's brought you through some of those, man, why didn't I see that earlier moments? I think we can begin to empathize with them a little bit. <laughs> but when it was day... After all of this, healing, casting out demons, verse 42 says that he departed and went into a deserted place. Jesus knew that he needed some alone time with his father. You know, I, I love church. I love worshiping with you. I love serving with you. But I'm glad that there are some times that I'm able to just kind of get alone with God. Even if right now it's, you know, while I'm helping build a house next door and renovating stuff and doing things like that, I tell you, I, 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 sometimes I really like those alone times where I can just think, talk to God, listen to, listen to a message about something and just have the Holy Spirit kind of work on me a little bit. Jesus needed that alone time and so do we. Take time to worship corporately. Be here in your place every week. But I hope that sometime throughout the week, sometime if not every day, you spend some time with just you and Christ. But even Jesus, as will happen to us, life tries to find us. <laughs> Jesus got away. He found this deserted place where he could be alone with God. And what happened? Well, the crowd sought him and came to him and tried to keep him from leaving them. Oh, we love you, Jesus. Please do more ministry. Teach us more. We, I mean, when you have someone that's just like hungering and thirsting, it's exciting. I had somebody tell me that a couple of weeks ago. They said, man, I'm just so hungry for the word of God. And I was thinking, yes, I love that. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they will be filled, Jesus said. 
I love seeing people that want Christ. But this happens to us sometimes. You try to get alone, you try to get away, and then life has a way of finding you, and you're like, I just wanted a few minutes. <laughs> I just needed a, a little bit of silence. I know it can be frustrating, but continue to push through. Continue to fight. Continue to make that time, that space that you might need. Maybe for some of us, you even need to schedule that out and say, okay, you know, I'm just going to, I'm going to shut everything off. I'm going to turn off the phone, turn off social media, turn off the news. I'm going to take a 24 hours, 48 hours, and don't worry, those of you that have FOMO, the fear of missing out, it's all right. I know that happens to me sometimes. I don't have my phone. Uh, uh, what's he? Okay, God, I guess maybe this is just one of those moments you have orchestrated so that you could have some silence. Life will catch up with you soon enough, but you need to take some time alone with God. But then, even though they wanted him to not leave, he said, I must preach the kingdom of God to other cities also, because for this purpose I have been sent. And he was preaching in the synagogues of Galilee. So Jesus was saying, I, I know you want me to stay with you. I love you. But I've got other things I've got to do too. I've got other places. I've got other people. They, they need this message also. They need this healing too. And so he told them, I, I have a greater mission, a greater purpose than just this here and now. That's even something that Jesus will see this theme again come around toward the end of his ministry with his disciples where they didn't want him to leave either after they had spent three years with them. They said, you can't leave us. He said, no, I, I've got to go because there's another that, that the Father wants to send to you, the spirit of comfort, this helper. But if I'm here, he can't come. So I have to leave. But Jesus, we can't hold you. We can't hear you. We can't, we can't touch you anymore. We can't, we can't see you. Don't worry. The Holy Spirit's going to continue to teach you things. He's going to continue to walk with you. He is going to be with you every step of your life. So while I look forward to the day when I will be able to see Jesus face to face, I thank God that his spirit is with me even now. And that while I love spending time with each and every one of you as, as time allows us to do so, I appreciate those of you that also recognize and say, you know, I, I know there's other things, there's other people that you might have to meet with. A lot of ministry going on. A lot of hurting people. A lot of people that need Christ. So again, as our church grows, I hope you recognize the fact that I am only one man and that we need to have other men of God that are called and equipped to be able to serve in a pastoral capacity because there's only so much that one person can do. I can only be in one place at one time. Thank God the Holy Spirit can be everywhere at one time. But for those conversations, those people that need to be led to Christ, that the gospel, those people that need to be baptized and discipled, I hope you'll pray with me that God would continue to raise up leaders here in our church so that way we can not just add to the church daily, but that way we can multiply those in the church, those that will grow, those that will be known as children of God. Again, I'm excited about what God's doing in our church, but just like here today, when Jesus began to do something, suddenly the demons showed up. First the devil himself at the beginning of this chapter and now at the end of this chapter, all these other forces of darkness, they start trying to stop and thwart what Jesus is doing. Yet if we simply continue to move forward in his power, praying to him, asking him to change us and use us, we can't succumb to the darkness. We have to continue moving forward in his light. I hope you'll be praying with me this week about what God's going to do this next Wednesday at the Tenebrae service, this next Sunday at our Easter service, and then what he is going to continue to do in our church body in the days ahead.
Let's praise him. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this time that we could spend in your word. Thank you for this time that we could worship you in song, worship you in the reading of your scripture, worship you in, in giving of our lives to you today, God, and I, whatever it is. If there is something, if maybe we need to spend more quiet time with you, God, that, that we would yield to that conviction today and find that time for you, make that time for you. Maybe, Lord, we're not doing enough ministry work. Lord, that we would jump into the battle today. That we'd find a place to get plugged in and serve. Also, Lord, I thank you for what you're doing in the lives of many people. Overcoming sin. Praying about physical ailments. Lord, I just ask even right now, if there is anyone in here that does not know Jesus as personal Savior, if they're not sure their sins are forgiven, that even right now, God, you'd be convicting their heart to take that first step, that step of salvation, accepting the gift, the free gift of life through Jesus Christ. Or if there are other things that we need to pray about today, be working now in our hearts during this invitation time. May you be honored, glorified, May the name of Christ be magnified. In Jesus' name, amen.